Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World Laureates Association Prize, the WOA Prize Laureates Lecture in Life Science or Medicine at the 5th WOA Forum. The WOA Prize is an international science prize established in Shanghai in 2021, initiated by the WOA, managed by the WOA Foundation, and exclusively funded by Sequoia China. The WA Prize aims to recognize and support eminent researchers and technologists worldwide for their contributions to science. It is intended to support global science and technology advancement, address the challenges facing humanity, and promote society's long-term progress. Today, we are very honored to have the inaugural WA Prize laureate, Dr. Dirk Gerlich, here in Shanghai to deliver a lecture. Dr. Gerlich is a scientific member and the director of Max Planck Institute for Multidisciplinary Science in Germany. He is awarded the 2022 WA Prize in Life Science or Medicine for key discoveries elucidating the mechanisms and selectivity of protein transport between the cytoplasm and the nucleus. His lecture title is the FG phase and the transport selectivity of nuclear poles. Let's welcome Dr. Gerlich. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to my lecture on intracellular transport. If we have a look at a eukaryotic cell, so a cell of an animal, a human, a plant, then you will see that such cells are subdivided by membranes into compartments. So the largest compartment is the cell nucleus and it's surrounded by the cytoplasm. These compartments are an expression of division of labor. So the cytoplasm makes proteins. Proteins are needed in the cytoplasm. They are, however, also needed in the nucleus. The nucleus harbors the genome, the genomic DNA, it transcribes DNA into RNAs and assembles ribosomes. These are protein synthesis machines and this needs to be exported to the cytoplasm where they function in translation. So this looks like a pretty complicated uh, process but it has a number of advantages that allow the cell to control how genes are actually expressed. For this to function, however, we need these transport processes. So the nucleus is surrounded by a double membrane that we call the nuclear envelope. This nuclear envelope is not permeable for any protein, for any RNA. Um, so for the purpose of exchange, there are nuclear pore complexes that provide channels for an exchange between the compartments. Every protein that the nucleus ever needs is initially made in the cytoplasm and needs to be imported through the nuclear pore complexes. And conversely, the nucleus makes ribosomes and RNA and exports them to the cytoplasm. And we are interested in the question how this cellular logistic is organized. Um, the first step in organizing this is that some cellular factor needs to be, needs to recognize what should be transported. We call these uh, receptors nuclear transport receptors. Uh, they come in two flavors. We have on the one hand importines that pick up cargos, for example, a protein in the cytoplasm, move through the nuclear pore complex. Here they encounter RAN GTP, a small molecule, small protein that can switch between two states. And when the import team meets the RAN, it unloads the cargo into the nucleus. It can then return to the cytoplasm and import the next um, cargo molecule. So it is a shuttle that circulates between the two compartments. We also have export teams which circulate in the same way. The difference is that they pick up their cargo in the nucleus and transfer it to the cytoplasm. These transport cycles are powered by a gradient of RAN GDP, which has a high concentration in the nucleus and a low concentration here. So this concentration difference corresponds to a chemical potential, so some kind of energy 
And this allows the import teams and export teams to pump cargo either into the nucleus or out of the nucleus. As a result of these transport cycles, one RAN molecule is transferred from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and it needs to be imported. And this is done by another nuclear transport receptor, which we call NTF2. NTF2 imports RAN in the GDP bound form and then a nucleotide exchange factor exchanges the nucleus and the cycle is closed. So I'm showing the NTF2 because it is actually the nuclear transport receptor that crosses nuclear pore complexes more frequently than any import team or export team. So it's a good molecule to study the fundamental processes. When we now just look at the process of passage through the nuclear pore, we find something that appears to be a paradox. We can take a protein that has a nuclear destination, and if nothing else is there, then the passage through the nuclear pore complex is actually very slow. The passage becomes faster when the import uh, cargo recruits an import in, and it then passes the nuclear pore maybe a hundred or thousand fold faster. And this is a paradox because the complex between import in and cargo is larger. It diffuses more slowly and one would actually expect the opposite effect, namely that the process is slowed down. Um, so what the slide also uh, already illustrates that we actually have two modes of nuclear pore passage. We have this passive passage, which is slow, and we have the facilitated one, which is somehow accelerated or facilitated by the import team, and we call this facilitated translocation. We can illustrate facilitated translocation in a simplified system. So you see here confocal uh, fluorescence images. Um, we have um, attached cell nuclei of human cells to cover slips on the stage of the microscope. In time zero, we add a GFP, the green fluorescent protein. We can then watch how it gets into the nucleus. This takes some while, about five to 10 minutes. And then the concentration is equilibrated. If we do this same experiment with NTF2, which has the same size, it looks quite different. So the first thing we see is this ring around the nucleus. And if I would show a higher magnification, then you would see it's actually um, many small spots and each of the spots corresponds to a nuclear pore complex. So initially it enriches at nuclear pores. And then a second later, we have already reached the same concentration in the nucleus as in the cytoplasm. So the NTF2 flows through nuclear pores as if it would not feel any resistance. So it's really very, very fast. It's an issue of seconds. And in fact, we know that not the passage through the nuclear pore complex is rate limiting for the process. It is actually the diffusion through the cytoplasm to the nuclear pore that is limiting. So some colleagues have measured then how long it takes to get a nuclear transport receptor through a nuclear pore complex. So um, Sigmosas and Uli Kubitschek's group measured that this takes about 10 milliseconds. And even if one looks at something large, like a 60S pre-ribosomal particle, it's an issue of about 20 milliseconds. So this is very, very fast for transport process. The capacity of nuclear pores for facilitated translocation is very high. A single nuclear pore complex can translocate up to a thousand nuclear transport receptor molecules in a second. And this corresponds to a mass equivalent of 100 megadalton. This is about 20 ribosomes within a second for a single pore. Facilitated translocation is mediated by an interplay between two compartments, the nuclear transport receptors I mentioned already, and the second uh, component are these intrinsically disordered FG repeat domains that bind the NTRs during translocation. You see here the amino acid sequence of such an FG repeat domain. And um, if you remember the amino acid code, then you will see that we have these phenylalanine glycine 
depeptide motifs over and over again. We have about 50 in such a domain. And what is special about these domains, they are different from a normal protein. Normal protein, such as an enzyme, folds into a compact structure. These domains are non-globular. We call them intrinsically disordered. They contain these FG motifs, and a nuclear pore complex um, contains actually quite a few of these FG repeat domains. And in total, we have about 5,000 motifs in a single nuclear pore complex. And the question now is, how could we explain when a nuclear transport receptor binds to such a motif that the passage through the nuclear pore complex gets faster? This is not a trivial uh, problem. And let me illustrate this with an um, experiment of thought. So let's imagine we have a central, a, a central channel that is lined with binding sites. So these FG motifs. And we can now ask if a species passes the pores faster when it's able to bind the motif or when it's not binding. So the green ones should illustrate the nuclear transport receptors. They can engage in the interaction. And when they do so, they bind and they would actually waste waiting time while being bound. And so we would actually expect the opposite. When the interaction occurs, the nuclear transport receptor should get through the pore more slowly. And also this simple-minded model could not explain why species that have no affinity for an FG domain would be blocked for passage. So the simple model cannot work. And the key conclusion we had was that we actually need to have a barrier in the first place. And uh, to explain this barrier, we developed the selective phase model. It assumes that the pore, the channel is filled with some material that is a good solvent for a nuclear transport receptor. So the nuclear transport receptor can enter the phase and exit on the other side. So this would be similar to a lipid B layer, which has a hydrophobic core. And if, for example, ethanol is uh, around, it can partition into the uh, lipid B layer, exit on the other side. And this explains why when we are drinking a glass of wine, that we feel some effects of the alcohol. However, if you look at a sodium ion, which has about the same mass as ethanol, this will not happen because it takes a lot of energy to get the sodium ion into the lipid B layer. It, it's just taking a lot of energy to transfer to such an environment. And we assume that the selective phase is a bad solvent for normal macromolecules, so they have no chance to enter it and are excluded from the passage. So um, what might form such a phase? There's actually just a single candidate, and these are again the FG domains. And in the simple model, we ignored something very important, namely that these are repeats. These are not isolated binding sites. We have about 50 along the linear polymer of the polypeptide chain. And because these phenylalanines are hydrophobic amino acids, so they don't like to be exposed to water, we should expect a hydrophobic interaction. So these spots are sticky, and they are sticky, they should interact with each other in a multivalent way and form such a multiply cross-linked uh, gel. So you see here meshes, and the size of the meshes could explain why small molecules such as nucleotides can still pass through the nuclear pore, but the nuclear pore becomes selective when the mobile species reaches a limit of maybe um, a diameter of maybe five nanometers. So a key question at this point was, does such a material actually exist? So we started our experiment with an FG repeat domain from the yeast nuclear point called NSP1. And um, the trick was to keep it non-interacting at time zero of the experiment. So we expressed this domain in bacteria, we purified it, and then we did something that peptide chemists do to their peptides. So we purify it um, by HPSC, 
and the protein was eluted by an acetonitrile gradient in the presence of trifluoroacetic acid. And then we lyophilize this, and this gives a fluffy powder. And if you add water to it, it dissolves instantaneously. And a few minutes later, however, it jellifies, it becomes a solid gel, as you see here. This gel had been before in a silicon tubing, and so we just pushed it with a syringe out and placed it onto this pattern support. And what you see, it's a transparent gel, so it's not just an aggregate. Um, it's elastic, so you can push with your fingers on top of the gel, it will deform, and if you relieve the pressure, it will jump back to its original shape. When we mutate the phenylalanine, so this hydrophobic amino acid to hydrophilic on serine, and we do it's exactly the same, there are no gel forms, it's just remaining a liquid. So this tells us that the hydrophobic phenyl group is essential for the gel formation. So we cannot place such a gel onto the stage of a confocal laser scanning microscope, as you see it here. So that's a chamber, this is our hydrogel, and this is a rectangular area we scan with a microscope. If we look at the channel that detects the FG hydrogel, then you see here the gel, you see here the buffer, it's black because there is no label. And if you then add, in this case, a fusion of red star, this is a tetramer red fluorescent protein, fused to a strong nuclear import signal, nothing happens. It remains on the buffer side, and even if we wait for half an hour, it's not getting into the gel. So it is the, the gel is a very good barrier against this protein. I mentioned that the RBB domain is a very strong nuclear import signal. However, in this case, it is silent because we have not added an import here. And then we did a similar experiment, but this time we did not look at this RBB red star fusion. We looked at the fluorescent import in beta, and I'm going to show you a movie so that you see the dynamics. So it had been added to the buffer side. The first thing that happened, it's binding to the buffer gel boundary, and then it's moving into the gel. It's moving into the gel actually quite quickly. You see here an area of 50 micrometers that is crossed within half an hour. Half an hour is a much longer time than the 10 milliseconds I mentioned that are needed to pass a nuclear pore complex. However, we look here at the distance of 50 micrometers, and this is a thousand times longer distance than the 50 nanometers that are needed to cross a nuclear pore complex. And if you now consider that the diffusion time scales with the square of diffusion distance, then this movie would actually run a million times faster at the scale of a nuclear pore complex. And then we come to a requirement of maybe 12 milliseconds to cross a distance of 50 micrometers. So these numbers are very consistent with the assumption that such a gel fills the center of the nuclear pore channel. We can play many games now with this experimental system. So for example, here we looked again at this IBB red star fusion but this time we added importine beta. It's a tetramer. So we actually get, get a species that is now almost five times as large as the cargo alone. So we look here at the species that has a mass of 500 kilodalton. And um, so if you look at an early time point, you see this uh, strong zone of enrichment at the buffer gel boundary. And the zone gets wider when we wait. But what's really interesting is this dark zone in front of the gel. So if you look at the quantitation, this is a concentration profile along the buffer gel boundary. And this is a concentration of this IBB red star fusion. The concentration essentially drops to zero. And this indicates that the diffusion to the barrier is rate limiting. And whenever a molecule gets close to the gel, it's absorbed, taken up, and diffuses into the gel. So this is a material behavior that material scientists call a perfect sink, meaning that almost every collision leads to an uptick into the phase. And this means that this phase can transport
the importing cargo complexes actually as fast as physics permits. So how is it possible that a nuclear transport receptor can get through the meshes that are too small to let the cargo alone pass? Our idea is that the meshes are formed by FG motifs interacting with each other. The transport receptors, however, as you see them here, have binding sites for these motifs. And when they bind the FG motifs, we assume that the meshes get disengaged. So the transport receptor can approach the barrier, can open a mesh, become part of the barrier and exit on the other side. And the nice thing about the model is that the barrier seals around the translocating species. So it remains a barrier even when there is a strong flux of transport receptors getting through. At this point, we had one problem. And that is, we observed this extreme selectivity of the FG hydrogel only when the local protein concentration exceeded a threshold of 200 milligrams per milliliter. This is a very high protein concentration. <clears throat> it's about the concentration you expect in a protein crystal. If the concentration is lower, then the meshes would get wider and we would lose selectivity. We cannot ask what is which concentration to expect at nuclear pore complexes. They are anchored there, the FG repeat domains, but this would only be enough to concentrate them, say, to a concentration of maybe 5 milligrams per mil. So this is not enough. Therefore, an additional concentration step is required. This is something Bruder Schmidt uh, discovered when he looked at a special FG repeat domain, namely the one of uh, NAP98. So what he did, uh, he expressed the domain, um, concentrated it, and dissolved it in three molar gunidinium hydrochloride. Gunidinium hydrochloride is well known by biochemists to unfold proteins and to keep them non-interacting. And then he diluted this a hundredfold in a physiological buffer, and then the gunidinium loses its denaturing effect. And uh, the result was actually quite amazing. So within the same second of dilution, one could see that the solution was slightly milky, opalescent, as if it would scatter light. And when placed on a fluorescent microscope, and we look here now at the FG domain spacer, Broda observed something that looked like small droplets, but they are not liquid, they're actually uh, solids as the gels I showed you before. And when then adding permeation probes, so M. Sherry, this is a protein that passes through nuclear pores only very slowly, then he saw that these FG particles or FG phases excluded the cherry really perfectly. So it's really not getting in there. And the mass here is just 25 kilodalton, so it's one fourth of the red star I showed before. The partition coefficient is really indeed very, very low. NTF2, in contrast, it has the same size, maybe a little bit larger, however, enriches very strongly. We have a partition coefficient of about 2000, so we have a selectivity factor here of four orders of magnitude. Um, we can then play with such material and explore its properties, and I'm uh, just showing now one experiment. This is a photo bleaching experiment. So we take a strong uh, laser, and when the fluorophore is irradiated by the strong laser, it becomes non-fluorescent, so it can no longer emit light. And then we allow this to recover, and the fluorescence this recovers only if fluorescent molecules manage to diffuse into the bleached area. And when we look at the FG domain, nothing happens. It appears to be a solid, at least when we look at translational diffusion. The NTF2, however, behaves quite differently. Already in the first frame after bleaching, we see here this rim. So it starts entering from the outside. And then a few seconds later, we actually have filled the entire um, FG particle, as we, as we call it. So this indicates there is a fast exchange uh, so NTF2 entering and also exiting the phase and also a fast movement um, through the phase. 
So it appears as if the transport receptor diffuses through a liquid. And this is a quite interesting um, aspect because the face itself appears to be a solid. And in fact, and I'm, I'm going to show some slides later on, we can apply a technique called NMR to look at mobility at an atomic scale. And there it appears that these FG repeats are locally behaving like a liquid with nanoseconds dynamics. Um, one cannot ask if this behavior of this FG is conserved in evolution. And we looked here at NAP98 from very diverse eukaryotic species. So we look here at fungi, we look here at uh, animals from nematodes, insects, vertebrates, we look at amoebas, we look at plants. Uh, so they are here in the evolutionary tree. And then we get already very far to ciliates or trypanosomes, which are almost the most uh, farthest relatives amongst the eukaryotes. And you can see that all these species have an up 98 that forms a very similar phase that excludes M. cherry and that accumulates NTF2 to very high concentrations. So this is something extremely conserved in evolution. And we also observed that the protein concentrations in this FG phase is pretty high. It's in the order of 300 milligrams per milliliter. And so the latest measurements even indicate that the concentration is even higher in the order of about 400 milligrams per milliliter. So what is special about these NAP98 FG domains? Um, they are different from globular proteins such as enzymes that fought by burrowing hydrophobic amino acids in the hydrophobic core. NAP98 FG domain is intrinsically disordered, meaning it does not contain information for a fault. And normal intrinsically disordered proteins are highly water soluble. They have a high contents of charged residues, which confer water solubility. The NAP98 FG domains they are also intrinsically disordered. However, they are very depleted of charges. So less than 2% of the amino acids um, are charged one. And they're also much more hydrophobic than a typically uh, intrinsically disordered domain. In fact, they're almost as hydrophobic as globular proteins. So we can plot this as a, at a diagram. So we plot here hydrophobicity of the amino acid sequence. We plot here the fraction of charged amino acids. If you look at blo globular proteins, they contain quite a few charges, about 22% of the amino acids of an enzyme are charged. They contain about 40% hydrophobic amino acids. The intrinsically disordered ones have even more charges, but are less hydrophobic. And the green spot here, this is um, NAP98 uh, from many sequences we collected at the time. So they're all very similar in uh, hydrophobicity, pretty hydrophobic, as hydrophobic as a globular protein, but they contain very, very little charges. And the consequence is that they experience water as a poor solvent, and this explains this phase separation process that allowed the assembly of these FG phases I just showed. So there are another few amazing properties so I guess you all know DNA-specific dyes that stain the DNA in nuclei, for example. So DAPI is one of these uh, uh, dyes or uh, the series of Höchst dyes. And uh, one should assume these DNA dyes are specific for DNA. However, John uh, found that they actually stain the FG phases very, very brightly. So if you add it to these FG phases and you look in the microscope, it really burns your eyes. What is interesting, we can do such a measurement also in bulk. So we put this into a cuvette and we see then this fluorescent signal. If we take a plasmid DNA, so that's so to say the positive control, uh, a NAP98 FG domain is actually not much less fluorescent in this assay. So these dyes uh, in the absence of DNA 
are non fluorescent They become fluorescent only when they bind their target. And this is happening also with these cohesive FG domains. What is interesting, we can take a non-cohesive uh, FG domain. This is a part of the already mentioned NSP1. This part is not cohesive, so it remains soluble in water. And this also does not give a fluorescent with the Hoos dye. So this is a way of measuring cohesive FG-FG interactions. So one of the key questions was, can we actually show in a real nuclear pore that the cohesion between FG domains is required for function. So the experiment is we assemble pores. In one case, we have a cohesive FG phase that uh, forms what I showed before. In another case, we take FG domains that are non-interacting with each other. How can one do this experiment? Uh, one can do this experiment with the help of Xenopus levis. So a female frog lays eggs. And this X can be converted into an extract. And if you take, so this is a centrifuge uh, tube after centrifugation with the extract. So this is extract. And if you now add an energy source and chromatin, then the extract assembles uh, a nuclear envelope around the chromatin and the nuclear envelope contains intact nuclear pores. And the experiment we can now do is before the assembly, we can remove NAP98, for example, with the help of antibodies, and then add NAP98 variants where we have exchanged the FG domain for another cohesive one or non-cohesive one. And we can then test the consequences on nuclear import or the passive diffusion. So to test active import, we can take an active import substrate that is fluorescent and for testing passive exclusion, we can, for example, um, at a fluorescent uh, dextrin of large size, so too large to diffuse passively through a nuclear pore complex. So then we can uh, observe different phenotypes. So if the nuclear envelope is intact and the nuclear pore complex is intact, and we look at a probe that remains excluded, we see black holes with nuclei IR and a bright signal outside. And if we have an active import substrate that accumulates, we would see strong fluorescence inside the nuclei and the low signal outside. And if the nuclear envelope or nuclear pores are not intact, then either probe would just equilibrate between the two compartments. So to cut a long story short, this is the result of such an experiment uh, performed by Bastian Hülsmann. Uh, if we add back the wild type cohesive NAP98 domain. Then we see here these nuclei that brightly accumulate this IBP-MPP fusion. So active import works. They also exclude the 70 kilo Dalton dextrin. You see the black holes. However, if we now add back a non-cohesive FG domain, which is totally happy in binding all the transport receptors, then we still see the DNA of the chromatin. However, we do not see any accumulation by active import and we see no passive exclusion. What is now interesting is when we add back an FG domain, which on its end terminus is cohesive and on its C terminus is non-cohesive, then this non-cohesive part dominates and we get again nuclear pores that are non-functional, so they cannot uh, allow for active import and they cannot allow for passive exclusion. And we did here a control. So we took the highly cohesive end terminus of this FG repeat domain. It's the first 175 amino acid and we normalized the length. So we needed four copies of this. And this now makes nuclei that are again totally happy in accumulating our import substrate and excluding uh, the dextrin. The nuclei look a bit larger here, and it simply means they have probably imported more protein molecules than in this control. So to put this into a scheme, we can look at the cross-section of a central nuclear pore channel. If the entire cross-section is filled with a cohesive FG phase, we have functional nuclear pore complexes. If it's filled with a non-cohesive phase, 
then it is leaky. So we cannot, um, I mean, an import team can try active import, but the cargo is not retained in the nucleus. It just diffuses back down the concentration gradient. If we have an FG repeat domain, which at the C terminus is non-cohesive and at the N terminus cohesive, so we might have this configuration. The center might be a good FG phase, but here we have leaky areas and the leaky areas dominate and make the pore leaky. If we just take the cohesive material and use it to fill the entire cross section, then again, we have a functional nuclear pore complex. And so this set of experiments makes a strong case that the selective FG phase is indeed required to make a functional nuclear pore complex. Um, so lately we had been interested in the question, um, what is really the, the essence of such an FG uh, phase? And we asked how simple can it get? You see here the amino acid sequence of a Y-type domain. And you see, even though it's a repeat domain, every repeat looks different. So it's not a perfect repeat. And we ask, and this is actually an experimental problem. If you try to apply methods to determine a structure of such a phase, um, we are faced with a problem that all the different repeats can interact in different ways and this complicates the structural problem just enormously. Um, so we ask, can we make a perfectly repeated FG domain? And if so, which boundary conditions do we have to fulfill? And it turned out the important boundary conditions were that we take the right FG motif. In this case, it's a GLFG motif. It was important to have the right distance between the FG motifs. So there is one motif in 12 amino acids. And uh, we use spacers in between that are similar in amino acid composition as the original domain. So there's not a single charged amino acid. And if we apply these boundary conditions and make a perfectly repeated FG domain uh, of a 12 map peptide and repeat this 52 times, then we get this simplified phase. It is showing a perfect transport selectivity, so it's excluding the M sherry and it's accumulating the NTF2 to a very similar factor as the original domain. And in fact, using this simplified phase, we could reconstitute any aspect of nuclear transport we have tested so far. So for example, we can reconstitute NTF2 mediated import of RAN into nuclei, we can look here at labeled RAN in the GDP bound form. So this should be retained by the barrier and you see it's pretty well excluded. So the face looks darker than the surrounding buffer. If we change the nucleotide to GDP, you already see some accumulation. So meaning the pore is more permeable for the RAN GDP form. And if we now add NTF2, then we see a 500 times better accumulation of RAN uh, in the presence of NTF2. So we have reconstituted this uh, process of getting RAN through the FG phase and then into the nucleus. We can also reconstitute import of a normal cargo, so an IBB GFP fusion without an import team is, is, it is excluded. When we add the import in beta, it gets accumulated about 200 times better than in the absence. We can also reconstitute uh, export mediated by a nuclear export signal or any as for short. Um, in the absence of the export team, this fluorescent protein fused to any as is excluded and we add the export team and run GTP that instructs the export team to bind its cargo. Then we see an accumulation that is several thousand times higher than in the absence. We can even reconstitute RNA export. So we used here an mRNA that encodes a, a translation termination factor about two kilobases in length. And um, if you look at our perfect GLFG uh, phase, um, it's excluding cherry. It's also excluding cherry when we add this mRNA exporter 
from yeast, the MAX67 MTL2 heterodimer that had been identified by the Edward Alan Tadokov, Israel, Le Conti, and other labs as being responsible for mRNA export in many organisms. Then the cherry doesn't change, but the mRNA now accumulates 500 fold within this phase. And in that, the perfectly repeated FG phase behaves very similar to original uh, FG phases from yeast, tetrahymena, or trypanosomes. This ultimately simplified FG phase, as I mentioned before, simplifies structural analysis. So we joined here forces with Lo and Andreas uh, uh, group. And you see here an NMR spectrum of the wild type um, FG phase. And uh, you see actually many peaks so tightly overlapping that we see these broad, uh, broadened spectra. However, if you look at the perfectly repeated phase, then we can uh, perfectly assign the sequence and see very sharp peaks for uh, the corresponding residues. We can then play many games. So for example, we can ask which interactions can we see within the phase. And um, one quite insightful uh, spectrum um, suggested that the hydrophobic amino acids of the FG motif, the phenylalanine and the leucine, they're not just interacting with each other, they are also contacting hydrophobic carbons in all the other side chains along the sequence. So the phenylalanine contacts the leucine, it contacts the methyl group of, thre of threonine, it um, uh, contacts the methylene groups of glutamine and proline and so on. And this indicates <clears throat> that we actually have a very large number of combinatorial different hydrophobic uh, contacts. And in a sense, this means <clears throat> that not just the FG motifs, but also the spacers are sticky. Another interesting question is, what is now the difference between a nuclear transport receptor and um, a normal macromolecule. What makes a protein inert towards FG domains and excludes it from passage? And the perhaps best answer to this is to create a nuclear transport receptor from scratch and then learn the rules. So our starting point was actually a pretty old experiment that we did 20 years ago. And uh, the experiment started from a HeLa cell extract. So it's a human cell line. And uh, if we bind this extract to immobilized RAN GTP, we actually see all the importines and exportines running between 100 and 140 kilodalton. Actually, we observed a very similar pattern when we used phenyl sulfurose instead. Phenyl sulfurose is a hydrophobic interaction matrix. And it just mimics the transport selectivity of nuclear pores perfectly well. So the experiment was done under very stringent conditions. Normally one has to add ammonium sulfate to see an interaction with this matrix. But in this case, the importines and exportines bind even in a low salt buffer. So they are the most hydrophobic soluble proteins within the extract. And so these are controls uh, where we did Western blotting against all the different importines and exportines. So um, one should assume when a protein has a hydrophobic surface, uh, it might then also pass through nuclear pores quickly. However, there's an interesting twist. If you have too much hydrophobicity on the surface, you make an aggregation prone protein and the importines and exportines somehow manage to escape aggregation by a quite sophisticated combination of surface residues. It turned out that not just hydrophobic residues on the surface make nuclear pore passage fast, also arginines can accelerate it. So the experiment looks a bit uh, complicated, but the bottom line is that we have two GFP variants here designed. This GFP, the SFFFR GFP4, there all the surface lysines have been exchanged to arginines. 
Lysine and arginine are po both positively charged residues, so what should assume they are very, very similar. And um, here we take the same proteins, but all the arginines on the surface are now exchanged for lysine. So again, a very similar residue. The effects are very striking. The arginines allow a strong accumulation within the phase, and having lysines instead, they are excluded from the phase. And we can also look at this when we measure passage rates through nucleopore complexes, then the arginine-rich variant is about a hundred times faster diffusing through nucleopores than the variant that has all uh, lysines on the surface. An explanation for this is that, um, I mean, it actually came from an old uh, crystal structure by Cole and Morbury, who solved the structure of the ribose binding protein. And what they observed in the hydrophobic core of the protein was the stacking of an arginine to a phenylalanine. We call this a cation pi contact. And it's caused by the positive charge of the gunadinium group being attracted to the negatively charged pi electron cloud of the, uh, of the phenyl ring. You might now ask why arginine and why not lysine? So one of the answers is there is a better shape complementarity between the planar gonadinium group and the planar phenyl group than if you use a lysine. And the other explanation is um, the ammonium group in lysine has a tetragonal a geometry that fits perfectly into the hydrogen bonding network of water. And so it is energetically more costly to remove it from the water than removing a gonadinium group. By extending that, we actually ask for each and every amino acid, does it favor entry into an FG phase or does it disfavor? And so we developed an amino acid scale for FG phase entry. And you see here lysins, um, cause a good exclusion, negative charges, so a glutamic acid and very hydrophilic residues cause an exclusion from the FG phase, while arginine allows an accumulation and we see even stronger effect for histidines, um, hydrophobic amino acids such as leucine or valine, methionine loss, uh, allows a very strong accumulation, Cysteine, this is also interesting because the human nuclear transport receptors have many cysteines on their surface. And of course, aromatic residues allow for very strong accumulation. So we can group the different amino acid side chains in FG-phobic, impeding nuclear pore passage, intermediate, or FG-philic. And the FG-philic ones are not just hydrophobic, they're also amphibian residues that like to be in water and in a hydrophobic environment, and this applies to arginine, histidine, and cysteine. We can now take this knowledge and design GFP variants to pass nucleopores very quickly. So you see here on a log scale, the passage rates through nucleopores. This is GFP, the starting point. And when we brought uh, eight tryptophanes or uh, um, isoleucines to the surface, this became pretty fast and combined with arginines, we then arrived at GFP species that passed nuclear pores even faster than NTF2. The story is a bit more complicated than I have time uh, to explain now because we had to solve the problem of aggregation. And we did this by an extensive selection uh, uh, screen where we mutagenize the GFPs and ask which species can be fast through nuclear pores and yet be resistant to uh, aggregation. And in the end, we identified, as I said, a few variants that pass nuclear pores even faster than NTF2. We can look at the opposite side of the spectrum, and there it was actually a very intriguing experiment to compare the nuclear passage rate of two fluorescent proteins that have an identical size, GFP and m -Sherry. So this is a red fluorescent protein, this is a green fluorescent protein, and they are different on their surface. And without any further modification, we observed that the GFP is consistently about threefold faster than m -Sherry. And both of the proteins we would have called inert 
it's already obvious from this experiment that there is no black and white. So it seems to be a gradual thing how inert a protein is. And so we applied the rules we had learned before. We started from GFP and then exchanged all the surface arginines for uh, lysins and we exchanged all the uh, surface residues that are hydrophobic for hydrophilic ones to make the uh, species more inert. So what happened initially that we got a fluorescent uh, protein variants that were actually non-fluorescent, so we had to do mutagenesis and, and select for mutations that uh, allow a folding in the context of a very hydrophilic surface. But in the end, we ended up with this super inert GFP4A which shows a 35 slower nucleopore passage than the starting point eGFP and it's actually 17,000 fold slower than the fastest GFP species that tests in identical size. So this uh, summarizes the um, engineering efforts. So we normalized our NPC passage rate to the one of, uh, of Cherry. NTF2 is about 700 times faster. We have a GFP that is 1,700 times faster. And we have a GFP species that has one tenth of the weight. And what was quite striking is that these NPC passage rates actually correlated quite well with the partition coefficients in the NUP 116 FG phase. And this again suggests that it's a very plausible model to assume that the permeability barrier of nucleopore complexes is made by a highly cohesive FG phase, such as the one of NAP116. So, um, yeah, I spent a bit more time than I actually uh, expected. Uh, so I think I uh, close at this point. Um, maybe I just show one additional slide, which is actually quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, so when you come back to the original model and you imagine that the transport receptor tries to drag a cargo through the permeability barrier, one would expect that the NTR, the transport receptor, likes to get into the face, but the cargo does not. So the question is, can one measure the effect that the cargo either favors or disfavors nucleopore passage? And the answer is yes, one can do this in many ways. So one way is we can look at the rate of nuclear import. So you see here nine seconds import reactions with importing beta and an IBB fusion either to a smaller GFP or a larger cargo. So we have here 38 or 88 kilodalton. And you see under absolutely identical conditions, the small cargo enters nuclei about tenfold faster than the larger cargo. So this is consistent with the cargo impeding partitioning into the face. We can also ask, what is happening if we take two cargos of the same size and one has a still translocation friendly uh, surface like the starting point GFP. We have used here three copies of GFP to IBB. And within uh, two minutes of import, we see an accumulation uh, that is in the nucleus a hundred times higher than in the surrounding cytoplasm. However, if we replace this GFP by this super inert GFP, which has a FG phobic, a translocation unfriendly uh, surface, then the import rate is about 300 times slower. So in fact, the accumulation inside nuclei is very slow. And you see that the species tries to bind to nuclear pores, but apparently it has problems in partitioning the cargo. So with this, I would like to close. I summarized most of the points already when I uh, walked you through the experiment. And at the end, I, it's a pleasure to mention that we had worked um, with 
uh, great collaborators. So in the early phase of the projects, Enno Hartmann and Siegfried Prehn were instrumental in NAP98FG domains. Bastian Hülsmann did the experiments in the Xenopus egg extract system. And uh, so I had little time to talk about John's uh, work, but uh, he did the simplification of the FG phase to a 12 mer uh, peptide. And we have a couple of uh, papers just published or uh, posted at BioArchives where you might have a look at. So with this, I would like to close. I thank you very much for your attention. Take care and have a good time.